so thanks everyone for coming. I'm going to post a link to our YouTube page in the chat, uh, just so that uh, everybody that's here uh, can uh, find the, the, this video and other webinars that we've done in the past. Um, I'm going to mention them a few times and you can uh, throughout this webinar and you'll be able to find them there. So subscribe to, to kind of follow along. Um, and so let me share my screen real quick. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can enhance your workflow uh, with Serepo by taking advantage of our Jupyter servers. Um, the, let me move this, uh, okay. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Because uh, the thing just said that my screen sharing is paused. Does anybody? I can see your screen. Okay. All right, great. Um, so uh, what we have, uh, so we've done a number of webinars about the, the various apps within Serepo to support several codes. Um, those apps give you pretty quick access to being able to run these simulations uh, very quickly with, with the various codes that are supported. But sometimes you need to do something that's a little bit more specialized or a little more in depth than what you can do through the uh, Serepo app. So right now I'm at serepo.com. Um, today I'm going to focus on an example in Elegant, but in principle, everything that we're doing today could be done uh, with any of the codes that we support. Um, yeah, that includes the machine learning activate. Uh, I'm not sure about controls. That might be a little different. Um, Maddox, Opal, if you're interested in magnet design, you can do this with Radia, Shadow and SRW for X-ray beamline design. Uh, all of this can be done uh, through Jupyter, what I'm showing with, with some slight modification, but today I'm gonna focus on Elegant. So clicking on Elegant uh, takes me into my, my home screen, my home workplace, uh, go into demos. And for today, we're gonna take a look at an example of the Los Alamos proton storage ring with some modification. So this base lattice is available in the examples on Serepo. If you click over here, I'm just using the Los Alamos proton storage ring, but I've made a few changes that I'll highlight. Uh, so I'll open that up and start the simulation. Uh, the first thing that I'll note is because this is a demo and I wanna move kind of quickly, I've reduced the number of particles per bunch from 10,000 to 250. Uh, while this is generating. Um, so this will help me run things a lot faster. Uh, this is a source tab. If I go over to the lattice tab, the other thing that I've changed is I've added uh, a watch point down here uh, so that I can dump the particle coordinates for, for the analysis we're gonna do in Jupiter. And I've added two octopoles so that something interesting will happen in what is otherwise a, a linear photo lattice. Um, the other thing that I've done is uh, the default for the example is to run one pass through the ring so that you can compute the twist parameters. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna run a thousand passes uh, just so that we can see some beam dynamics happening with the octopoles. So if I go to the visualization tab so I can start the simulation, I click on start simulation. I'll share a copy of this simulation in the chat uh, so that other people can, Lionel PSR. So that uh, you can follow along either now or, or later um, with, with the simulation. So this is running, this will take about 45 seconds. While that's going on, uh, I'll note that the key thing that we're doing right now is we need to export this simulation. We're going to want to move that over to Jupiter so that we can run uh, our analysis over there. Right now, the way that's done is you click on this wheel tab up in the top right corner of your browser and you click on export as zip. Uh, and then this will ask me where to download it. I've obviously downloaded this before. I'll put this in my, my downloads directory, place that. Um, and that, and then we'll upload that back up into Jupyter when we get to it. All right, so the simulation's done. Um, one thing to, to finish up on that, right now, this has to be done manually. We're in the process of implementing uh, the ability to automatically export the zip file to Jupyter. Uh, that's a work in progress. I'm not 100% sure what the timeline is on that, but in the near future, you won't have to do what I just described with the zip file. You'll, it'll just be a button uh, that exports to your, your Jupyter homepage. Um, so we've got our usual output of an elegant simulation. We've got the output parameters um, from the twists. We've got the beam centroid. It's not moving around that much. Uh, we've got the output distribution. 
uh, the twist parameters and what's going on here. So this is that watch point that I added. Uh, and that this is showing um, the X and Y emittance. And it looks like the, with the octopoles, the emittance is exchanging between X and Y. And we might wanna go in uh, when we see something like this and understand what's going on at a more granular level. And that's actually not that easy to do with the Serepo app because this is sort of a specialized analysis. It's a bit of a corner case and it would be very hard to, to build an app that's both usable um, and able to dig deep uh, on, on these very specific questions that you might run into because of your physics. And this is where the, the Jupyter server comes in. So now I, I know what I wanna look at. I wanna look at the single particle motion that's causing this emittance uh, exchange. And so I'm going to go over to our Jupyter server. Uh, I happen to already be here. Um, if you go to Serepo.com, to get here from Serepo.com, you would just go to Serepo.com, click on Jupyter, and it will boot up your Jupyter server. Um, takes a second. Another thing that's worth noting is if you've never used our Jupyter server before, we are having to whitelist people to keep out crypto miners. Uh, it turns out that was a bit of a problem for us for a bit. So if you've never used Jupyter before, uh, expect to wait about 24 hours max and before we add you to a whitelist after your, your first request. Um, so we're, we're working on automating that. So, but right now it's about 24 hours as, as a maximum it might be less. Um, but just something to be aware of. Um, so I, I go into my Jupyter, it shows me the workspace that I'd already set up. Uh, for those who don't know, Jupyter is an open source project uh, that leverages Python among other things, um, specifically notebooks, uh, Jupyter Hub, which is sort of a development environment, uh, various widgets, things like that. Um, so it's useful for doing a lot of inter interactive visualization, uh, a little bit of development. It supports a number of codes other than Python, uh, such as Julia and R. Right now, Radiosoft does not support that. We haven't had uh, any requests to support that, but if uh, enough people ask us to support Julia, we'll probably look into it. Um, and the Jupyter Notebook, which is gonna be the main thing that we focus on today. Uh, so if I go back to my, my environment, um, this is a Jupyter Notebook. If I close everything, it gives me a prompt that asks me what I want to open. I can open a new empty Jupyter notebook. I'm not gonna live code uh, today. Uh, so I've already got one set up, but I can create a new blank one. I can open a Python console. And this is just the usual uh, console that you'd see if you go into your terminal and just type Python uh, import numpy uh, and it runs uh, all of that. Uh, it also has a terminal and the ability to edit text files and markdown files, which I'll show a little later, and uh, contextual help, which is just uh, uh, support. So uh, the first thing we need to do is move the simulation into the environment. I've already got a backup here in case something goes wrong. Um, if I go over to my downloads, I can click and drag uh, my zip file over this window, it'll show me that it's, uh, it'll have this gray highlighting that I'm moving the file in. You can also download files this way and I've got a zip file here. Um, so if I double click on it, it gives me an error because it doesn't know what to do with a zip file. So I need to go into the terminal and unzip it. So I'll create a new terminal window here. It opens it up on my homepage. I will go into Jupyter Webinar, which is the directory that I'm doing all this in. And I will unzip lanaloctopole psr.zip, hit that, and it unzips two files. This is These are the two files that Serepo needs to replicate the simulation. And we see a moment later it, it, it has appeared. Uh, if we look at the serepo.data.json file, uh, this just has some information about um, that's, that's internal to Serepo. Uh, if you're really good at Serepo development, you can hack these files, but uh, probably not. This is just so that you can upload a zip file to the Elegant Serepo interface and have it just kind of pop up. Uh, and run.py. So run.py is uh, created for every single um, uh, 
code when we do this zip export. This is a Python file that Serepo runs in the background, that it generates it and then runs it in the background. And so what we've got here is we've got the execution mode uh, runs in serial. We've got some documentation. This was the name of the, the Serepo simulation. We've got a string for the lattice file. So this is saying, specifying all the drifts and the octopoles, the beam lines that are being generated, ring two, which is the full beam line. You can see the octopoles are in here, uh, beam line one, two, and three. Um, and then we have the uh, elegant file. This is another string. This is what generates the .ele file, if you're familiar with running with elegant. Uh, this is just the input file. Um, this file will look a little different for every single code, uh, but the basic concept is the same. Um, uh, okay. Um, so we've got all of these parameters that were set in Serepo uh, and Elegant through the control tab or the source tab, which again, if you're interested in learning more about how to run Elegant, uh, you can get uh, a web, we've got webinar material on how to run Elegant through Serepo. And then down here we have uh, a little bit, oh, don't do that because I'll break the code. Uh, we've got a little bit of Python here that will write the lattice file from uh, the string up here and write the .ele file from the string here. And then it imports OS and then it runs elegant.ele uh, through the command line. So if we go back to the terminal over here, see all the functions that we've got. I'm just going to get rid of the uh, zip file so that I don't have it there. Uh, and then if I run python run.py, uh, this will start running this, this elegant simulation. Uh, while this is running, I should note a little bit about what's special about the um, uh, our Jupyter Hub server versus a Jupyter Hub server that you could run locally. Uh, this server comes with a Docker container called BeamSim that's already pre-installed with a number of uh, accelerator codes. So here's a partial but fairly complete list of the codes that we currently support. Uh, all of these are pre-installed in the environment. So we've got a number of tracking codes, uh, including several that we don't currently support with Serepo, such as the Genesis uh, 1.3 FEL code and... Um, FB pick, which is a, a Fourier Bessel particle and cell code for modeling plasma accelerators supported out of Berkeley. We have the full warp code, uh, the current warp VND and warp PBA implementations on Serepo uh, only expose a small fraction of warp, but the whole thing is available through our Jupyter environment. Uh, we have uh, SRW and Shadow for X-ray optics. We have a number of machine learning libraries, including uh, the fairly standard ones such as TensorFlow, Keras, Scikit so learn. We also have GPy, which is for Gaussian process regression, uh, and PyTorch as well. Uh, we also have Radio, which is a magnet design code, JSpec, which is about um, electron cooling, the EPIX control, uh, Phoenix and Hyper, and a number of other codes as well. We also have a full distribution of LaTeX and the full SciPy stack. So that's SciPy, NumPy, Matplotlib. And we will be using uh, NumPy and Matplotlib. Uh, during this demo. Uh, you can find the full examples either on containers slash BeamSim, or we also have uh, BeamSim Jupyter. These are available on GitHub. Um, and you can, so you can uh, clone this yourself uh, and, and build a local environment if you want. Uh, if we go back to the Jupyter Lab tab, we're done. We've run our simulation. We've got some data sitting out here. So let's um, go into this Jupyter tab. Now, a little bit about the Jupyter Hub environment. Uh, this little green knob here tells you that this is running in the background. Um, so this is already up and running. It's a, it's a functioning environment. I can see what's running. If I go over to these side tabs here, I can see running terminals and kernels uh, here. Click on that, and it shows me I've got a number of uh, Jupyter notebooks I was working with earlier. I've got um, a, the Python console that's still running in the background, and then Terminal 1 and Terminal 2. I can shut these down if I want. Uh, I'm going to shut a few of these down um, so that it's not using resources in the background. Go back over here, open up my Jupyter notebook. We got a Jupyter notebook. Um, so what a Jupyter Notebook is, is it's a way to run Python interactively 
Uh, I mostly use it for data visualization. Uh, you can also use it to drive simulations uh, that you run through the command line. Um, we run into some, some interesting performance issues sometimes when doing that, but it's not consistent and we haven't really nailed down what it is about Jupyter, um, but just something to be aware of. Uh, we've got the usual Python import statements that you'd expect. We're obviously gonna do some number crunching with NumPy and we're going to do some visualization with matplotlib. So we've got those imports. We also have uh, two imports from RS Beams. Uh, RS Beams is an open source library uh, supported by Radiosoft. So if you go to github.com slash Radiosoft slash RS Beams, uh, you can clone this. Uh, Chris was making uh, some fixes four days ago for this webinar. Uh, you can clone this and run it, uh, build it locally. And what this is, is it's a number of uh, utilities that Radiosoft has found useful over the years for our work with um, running and analyzing uh, beam dynamic simulations. So what we'll use here is the incredibly useful read SDDS uh, utility, as well as the beam plots utility. Um, <clears throat> so if I'm hovering over this cell, I hit shift enter or I hit the play button up here and it runs and it imports these libraries. And then this next cell is Markdown. So in a Jupyter notebook, you've got uh, multiple kinds of cells. You've got code, you've got Markdown, you've got raw. Raw is just plain text. I, I personally rarely use it, but there, uh, you might. Uh, Markdown is what's going on in here. So Markdown allows, Markdown allows a little bit of text formatting. So I can use uh, the pound sign to indicate um, sections, I can text format uh, code, I can add equations, which I'll show later. And this is really useful for documenting your um, notebook so that when you share it with somebody else, they can follow your line of reasoning. So for example, right now, this is a header one. I might wanna turn this into a header two, which is putting two uh, hash marks there and then add another cell and move it up here and go to Markdown and change this to, um, what shall I call this? Uh, Jupyter Hub Beam Dynamics Demonstration, uh, Stephen Webb, uh, sweb at radiosoft.net. Uh, I can also um, format uh, links, which I'm now going to live code, which is a little dangerous, but can, I believe I can do this. If I click on this link, it will open up my uh, my mail app. So I'm not going to click on it, but uh, it'll open it up and you can send an email to me. Um, again, I have, so I can do lists, um, read in data to look at raw data slash lattice, three compute Ron Snyder invariant. Uh, and it formats it as a, as a list. So, so Markdown is very useful if you're making something that you're planning on sharing in the future uh, with other people. Um, so if I now go into this cell, so I've got this cell, I'm now going to read in the twist parameters. Uh, I hit enter and it gives me uh, an, a name error, name twist file is not defined. So this is something that I did intentionally. And this is because uh, one of the things that Jupyter can hang you with as distinct from a Python script is that I can run cells out of order. So I've got this error here because I haven't read in twist file. Twist file gets defined uh, in this next cell. So if I hit enter here, I've read it in uh, and then I can go back to this cell and run this cell <clears throat> and it generates this plot, this nice plot of the uh, twist parameters versus the, the beam line lattice uh, using the beam plots utility from RS beams. Um, so this highlights one of the pitfalls of Jupyter. Uh, usually when I'm developing a Jupyter notebook, when I think I'm at a good stopping point, I will go up to this kernel and I will hit restart and run all cells and just make sure that everything runs in order from top to bottom. Uh, I've got this numbering next to it, which tells me the sequence that I've, I've uh, run the cells. So I ran this one first. I ran this one second. Second is gone because that was an error. I ran this one third, and then I ran this cell fourth. So that's just a good bookkeeping tool. Uh, really, I want to move this cell below this cell so that um, <clears throat> it just runs straight through. So now what might be useful is 
restart clear all output. It'll ask me if I'm sure I want to do this. Um, you might not want to do this if you've read in a large file and it took 10 minutes to read in that file or what have you. Uh, just be aware that that blows that away and then we start over. But since we haven't done that, uh, we'll do this. Uh, that's another good practice in Jupyter Notebooks. It's very useful if you're generating large files to store them in a, an external format so that when you restart your notebook, uh, you do not lose that data and have to regenerate it. Uh, but that's uh, that's just a good practice. So we'll read this in. We'll run the bean plots. This indeed looks like the twist parameters that we computed over here, especially if I turn off the dispersion. This looks like the twist parameters. So just to just a sanity check, make sure that we're reading in the right file and everything is the same. Um, now what we'll do is we'll read in uh, the data from W2. I uh, had this reading in from uh, this folder. You don't need to do for this. Uh, and then we'll take a look at the emittance X and emittance Y. So you can see that like uh, the watch two is a NumPy array. It's a labeled NumPy array. So it has pass, EX, things like that. Um, run that. We can see that we've got this, this emittance exchange that we saw uh, last time um, over in Serepo. Just again, make sure that sanity check, we're seeing the same thing. We might not see the same thing, just depending on how the random number seed is, is being set. Um, so just something to be aware of. Uh, and then we go into our beam dynamics analysis. Again, we've got more markdown. This was a one. We probably want this to be a two because it's not the title. The title is a one. This is a two. Emittance should be a two. Um, and then, well, this is labeled particle coordinates. Uh, this has got the three hashtags. I believe this goes down to four hashtags before the formatting gets a little strange. Um, <clears throat> so read in and look at scatter plots of the coordinates. Again, this is maybe not the best documentation example. Uh, but you can see where this is very useful if you're going to be sharing this notebook with other people. Um, you, 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 it, it gives you the chance to, to help people figure out what it was you were doing without you having to sit there with them. Um, clean documentation. So we read in the, the data from watch point one, which is the particle coordinates. Let's take a look at XPX because we expect this to be an ellipse. And it is. Uh, I can go back and I can change the size of the, the dots because these are kind of big and they're kind of sitting on each other. Um, I can then change plot.x label of x. And this will support LaTeX. In fact, I believe the reason that we support the entire tech distribution in this um, uh, container is because of matplotlib initially. Uh, and then I want to look at px. So in elegant coordinates, it's x prime. I'm calling it the canonical px. Uh, we run that, and we get these nice LaTeX labels as well. Um, I can also set the title uh, x coordinate phase space. Not like that because I didn't close the uh, the quote. Now I've closed the quote. Um, if you don't want this output being put in there, uh, just add pass and a semicolon at the end, and it will suppress the, the printed output. So that's a nice way to kind of clean up your, your plotting utilities. Um, so obviously, we want to look at a single particles uh, Poincaré section, just get an idea of, of what it's doing in its phase space. So I wrote this function. It's called plot Poincaré. Um, you can define functions in a Jupyter notebook, uh, and it's the same rules as a usual Python file. Um, you can also define entire objects and classes in, in a Jupyter notebook. Again, you just have to make sure that it's defined before you use it, otherwise it'll throw an error. Uh, so we're going to look at particle ID number 23, and we're going to take a look at XPX, YPY. I'm just going to read that in. And then I'm going to take a look at what the uh, Poincaré section looks like for XPX, YPY. Uh, it's, going, it's going crazy. Um, there's a lot of coupling here. You've got this in and out, uh, uh, in and out oscillations here. Um, 
We might want to look at this in the normalized coordinates uh, using the Courant Snyder invariance, which we described earlier. So maybe I want to document why I'm doing this. So I can say here, I can use markdown. I can say, uh, look at transverse motion in normalized coordinates. And then I can define an equation using dollar sign. And I can say hat Q is equal to Q divided by square root beta. And hat P is equal to P times the square root of beta plus alpha over square root of beta times Q. Carriage return that. And now I've documented with equations uh, that are now typeset in LaTeX. So the next person that comes along understands what's going on here. Uh, and then I can run the same thing. The function that I wrote returns fig and axe, so I can manipulate uh, the axes and, and figures a little bit. So you can see that in the normalized coordinates, it sort of straightens out the ellipse. So rather than it being tilted, now I'm seeing all this spiraling in X and Y. And the, something that I might want to look at after this is, is the actual Courant Snyder invariance. So something that I can, something else I can do is I can put hyperlinks to other parts of my code, uh, of parts of my notebook um, using uh, uh, this markdown syntax. So right here, I've got a, a, a link to my references section, um, which won't work because references is down here. Double click on that, make it here. So if I go back up here, I can click on this link. What's going on? Okay, that was working earlier. So let me undo what I have done. There we go, takes me to references. And then I put in this reference to the Courant Snyder paper with a hyperlink, an external hyperlink using the, uh, the DOI number. I can click on that since I'm working in my browser and it takes me to uh, the Science Direct page with the theory of alternating gradient synchrotron paper. Um, so if I wanna look up where this comes from, I can keep these documentations uh, sitting around. Uh, so if we then, compute the action and angle, the action in X and Y, which is P squared plus Q squared in both cases, plot all three of them on the same axis. We see that what we're seeing here is one is going down, the other is going up, but their sum it seems fairly well conserved uh, right here. Uh, so I can put a label on this and I can call this, I can actually put LaTeX labels on this so and call this AX. And then I can do the same thing for the Y label down here, AY. I can put AX plus AY. And I can do, I believe it's fig.legend, fig.type layout to make sure that I'm not putting anything on top of it. And then I can save the figure. So I then run this. Did not like that, ah, there's two commas there. Did not like that. And I've got my legend over here labeling the three plots. So I can see that AY is going down, AX is going up, but the sum of the actions is conserved. That's interesting, potentially. Uh, so I saved it so that I can put it in a paper later. And I can open that PNG over here. Uh, and then I can download it by, if I right click on this, it'll show me all the options I can do with the file. So I can, uh, I can download it, I can make a duplicate of it. I can copy it so I can paste it elsewhere. I can delete it. Um, and then I can create other new, new folders. Um, <clears throat> so we've got this interesting analysis. We did the plots, we've got these references. Uh, there's a few other things that you can do with this. Um, one thing is that uh, you can run Git through our Jupyter server. So if I have a repository where I'm collaborating with people here, I can commit the files to that repository and push it remotely. I can create a new markdown file and it starts off as untitled.md, but I might want to make it a readme file because I'm uh, uh, 
working on GitHub and I want to see that documentation so up. So I rename, so I right click and I click on rename. I renamed it to readme.md. I open it and it knows uh, that this is my uh, current Snyder for LANL PSR with Octopoles. It's uh, text highlighting because it knows that this is Markdown. I can right click on this and click on show Markdown preview and it's gonna show me what I'm doing. Uh, so I can further document this, author Stephen Webb. And then I can email and then say sweb at radiussoft.net. I can make this a hyperlink so that radiussoft.net two in here to get the that nice carriage return and then uh, documentation. Here are some notes run in radiussoft Jupyter Hub. Uh, requires RS beams. Other things that you can do, uh, so RS beams is supported. Uh, RS opt is supported. Uh, if you're trying to run optimizations or parameter scans based off of a Serepo simulation where you set up your, your baseline simulation in Serepo Elegant and you wanna maybe parameter scan the octopole strengths, uh, you can run RS opt. Chris gave a webinar about using RS opt uh, a couple months ago. You can find that on our YouTube page. Um, and then you have uh, the full power that's available to you by running through Python. Um, so I can develop, I can run my Python script, I can develop my Python script um, using the, the text editor. Uh, I can do these previews. I can break this off into a separate window by just clicking on it and dragging it. And now I've got run.py on my right and I've got my documentation on my left or my, my notebook. Uh, notebooks support a number of things such as sliders and other widgets, so I could interactively manipulate this if I wanted to. Um, the sky's the limit, really, at this point. Um, so if there's something specific that you would want to, to do, uh, you can either join the Serepo Slack channel and ask questions or uh, spend some time on Stack Exchange uh, to do some more specialized stuff. Now there's the, This is where you go when you need the flexibility that Serepo just doesn't add. Um, so there's a number of changes that are kind of coming with this. Uh, one I've already mentioned is that we have to whitelist for Jupyter because this service is currently uh, included with uh, Serepo Basic. So it's freely available and some crypto miners decided that that was a good opportunity for them um, to, to, to very inefficiently, but for free, uh, try and get some Bitcoin. Um, so now we have to whitelist things. Uh, that's why we can't have nice things. Um, we're in the process of automating that, so that should happen uh, kind of soon. Another thing that's going to happen in the next couple of weeks is we're currently running Jupiter 2. Uh, you will be uh, able to, we will be upgrading to Jupiter 3. Um, so that has some implications. A uh, big one is that one thing Jupiter Hub allows is what's called extensions. Uh, you can read more about what each of these do, uh, does. Um, some of these are third-party apps. Uh, we are not responsible for whether or not they will work correctly, and some of them are required. For example, this one's required for running uh, Radia through Jupyter uh, and having it look the way we wanted it to. So that comes pre-installed. Um, there's a few such as uh, there's Git that you can install. Um, uh, a table of contents, there's a debugger. Uh, the debugger extension, for example, that does not come pre-installed. Um, that the debugger and the table of contents are some of the ones that will be installed by default in Jupyter 3.0. Uh, something to note is there is a um, because this is our server. When we do software updates to the underlying Docker container, we have to restart the server. So any third-party um, uh, things that you install, either uh, I can actually uh, just straight up uh, install install things here. So I can say pip install, um, oh, what's a Python library that's, uh, let's see. I don't think Plotly comes installed. So I can run pip install Plotly and it will start to install Plotly. 
Uh, it's already installed, uh, but I can install other third-party apps. Those will all be blown away every time we restart. Uh, there is a way to do this using a specialized bash RC file. If anybody's interested in going that deep, I can um, uh, send you the, uh, the instructions for how to do that offline. You can email me at uh, sweb at radiosoft.net. Um, and I can talk you through how to do that, or we'll uh, we'll probably publish some documentation on that uh, shortly as well. Um, there's there's a lot you can do here. Uh, this is a full development environment. It's it's you know it's all of Python and as well as uh, that list of codes that are already pre-installed. Um, so this is a good place to go when you have to do something a little more specialized. Uh, so if anybody has uh, with that, uh, if anybody has any questions. Um, please feel free to type them into the Q&A. Awesome. Thank you for that, Stephen. We do have a couple questions that we're going to get started on here. So our first question is, can I execute codes such as Elegant or Opal in parallel on your Jupyter environment? Yes, you don't have access to a lot of cores, though. Chris, how many cores do they have right now? Uh, default uh, for for users is four cores, I believe. Okay, so so you could run it in parallel, but you'll only have access to four cores through uh, Serepo Basic. Awesome, thank you. Um, next question is: Can these also be run offline or only in Serepo? So that's that's a fun, complicated question. Um, if you have uh, if you have the dependencies. Uh, this run.py, as, as you can see, it doesn't depend on anything outside of the Python dependency. So if running elegant, elegant.ele in your local environment will work, then run.py will work there. Uh, all of the input files that are generated are just elegant input files. So again, if you've got elegant working on your local machine, uh, you can run that too uh, locally. Um, something else that is sometimes done is you can actually build the uh, Serepo Docker container on your local machine and run in there. Uh, that's a little more technically involved. Um, frankly, it's easier to just use ours. Um, but if that's something that you wanted to do, uh, that is certainly an option as well. So definitely uh, you could share this ELE file or the LTE file with any of your collaborators, and it's just an, uh, an elegant lattice or, or .ele file, uh, and they can just run it even if they've never even heard of Serepo. So um, yes, uh, with some caveats that you do need to have all the dependencies in place, which is taken care of within the Jupyter Hub server. And then we have, what is the easiest way to download files from the Jupyter environment to your local device? Oh, um, it depends. Uh, how many files uh, are you trying to download? If you're just trying to download the PNG, uh, such as here, uh, you can just right click and click download and it will ask me where it wants to go and I'll put it in my downloads. Um, if you need to zip it up uh, or you know make a tar ball, you'll have to tar the files and I'm not about to attempt to use tar uh, live. <laughs> <laughs> I will have to look up what the uh, what the letter sequences are, but uh, you can tar the files and then download the uh, the tarball. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to get it onto your local machine. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we have a question about cores, so Chris might want to sure. chime in on this one. How many cores are available for the Serepo Premium plan? Yeah, so actually, this is a good opportunity. If we go to Serepo and we go to plans. Um, This will have uh, uh, some of the information. I, be <laughs> I believe uh, Serepo Premium is still just four cores. Is that correct, Chris? I'm not sure. We don't actually list a policy here, I believe, yeah, for, there's, for Jupiter. I'll there's been on some that. discussion on this, uh, and we haven't quite landed on a number. I assume it's four because there's nothing specialized about it. Um, that may change though. So you should um, just be aware that assume four, if you try to use six, it will just, you'll just notice that it doesn't work right. Um, it will, you won't necessarily notice any problems here. Right. Just the degraded performance, but there won't be any errors or notifications that you've done something wrong. 
Right. So I believe the number is four. Uh, that could that is subject to change, though. That's currently in our product management uh, team development. So we'll keep you posted on that. All right. So we're at twelve forty, uh, which is all the time that we have allowed for today. So. Thank you everyone for coming out and participating. Thank you to Dr. Stephen Webb for putting this up with us today. And uh, everyone who registered for this event will receive a follow-up email and a link to the webinar recording sometime in the next week. And let me just say we have another um, Zgooby webinar coming up with Dr. Dan Abel in November. So please tune in for that one. Thank you everybody. And I hope you have a great Wednesday afternoon. Um, just before you leave, uh, if anybody wants to follow up with questions here, uh, I'm posting an invitation to the uh, Serepo Slack channel. Uh, this will be good for the next 20 days. Uh, but if you want to join our Slack channel and ask questions there, uh, that's a great place to uh, ask questions. So that's in the chat. Um, and you can go, uh, go there and ask questions about Jupyter or all the other codes that we support. I'll include that invitation in the follow-up email as well. So if you haven't grabbed it out of the chat, you'll be able to find that resource in the, in the email information. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye, everyone. Thank you.